Uh, we have a, a Green Themes presentation this evening, and I'm very happy to welcome Pat Lindemann, our Drain Commissioner for Ingham County. Uh, last time I, I heard Pat talk uh, was about 10 years ago over at uh, MSU Fisheries and Wildlife, and I was delighted to hear uh, some of the wonderful plans that uh, he had in, in store, and now some of them are, are, have come to fruition and others are, are just around the corner. Um, I think this is a great uh, opportunity to hear uh, a follow-on from last month's Green Themes presentation, which unfortunately I couldn't attend, but I did watch the video. Um, and uh, it, it strikes me that while we didn't actually plan it this way, what we had was uh, uh, one Green Themes presentation about uh, uh, how uh, the climate has been changing in Michigan, including uh, how the rain is falling. And tonight, we get to hear about what happens after it hits the ground. So thank you so much for joining us this evening and, and look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. I always uh, like to take these opportunities. I call them teachable moments. So a lot of people don't understand infrastructure and they understand less about rain and uh, the impacts of it and so on and so forth. Um, generally speaking, we have 536 um, county and inter-county drains in the, uh, in the county. If you stretch them end to end, it would be somewhere around 1,400 miles. That would be from here to Miami, Florida, which is quite a distance. So my job and my staff's job is to try to manage those drains and uh, keep them in working order so that, they, uh, so that property damage and life safety and health safety and welfare are preserved as best we can. Um, Meridian Township has 181 of those drains, and there are five intercounty drains in Ingham County that you're associated with. So in whole or in part, you have about 181 of those 536 drains. In the Red Cedar watershed, there are 236 drains that are in Ingham County that affect the quality of water of the river that runs through your township. Um, there are uh, just a little bit about the drain code. Uh, the drain code was first written in uh, the first legislative session in 1838, and we became a state in 1837, and they passed the drain code of Michigan. We're the only state in the United States that has an elected official with its own law to manage natural resources and uh, to manage infrastructure with the power to tax the power to condemn property and all of the other bells and whistles that are associated with that law. It's interesting to know that that law first was adopted in 1435 and it was written by a person by the name of Geoffrey Chaucer of all people and um, he was appointed by King Richard, I think it was King Richard II, to be the commissioner of ditches and dikes of England, of all things. And he was asked by the king to, uh, he was given a lot of power by the king to manage the waterways, basically, and all the dikes that were formed. <clears throat> and he uh, was given the power to tax all the people on the land by the king <laughs> to pay for it. And he wrote what's called the Common Law of England for water and riparian rights. And that law has been, when we had a revolution kick King George out of here, we kept two really good things from England. One was afternoon tea time, and the other one was that law. And in 1837, it became slightly changed, but it became, the principle is all the same. Uh, it became Public Act 40 of the state of Michigan, the drain code, which gives each county an elected official to manage infrastructure and water movement and so on and so forth. So we've done a lot of work in, in, in Meridian Township with the drains, and uh, if you can understand 181 drains and what that means uh, to your township, it is that uh, Meridian Township is by and large a swamp that's been drained, and um, it has some problems with, surf with uh, soil water and surface water movement, and hence the drains and the importance of those drains. So um, in the last 24 years since I've been drain commissioner, we have uh, slowly started to, um, at the beginning, we slowly started to change our, our, um, our maintenance policies to be proactive rather than reactive. So we used to have reactive behavior in previous drain commissioners and they didn't like doing work unless there was something that f broke. But what that meant was is it cost a lot more money 
if you didn't fix it and maintain it regularly, it's like a car that you don't change the oil in. It uh, breaks down faster and, and it performs less. So we have um, stepped that up and today, uh, this is one of the wetter springs that we've ever, wettest springs that we've ever had in history. And uh, the soils all over the county are, are, are really saturated. I had eight inches of water in my backyard and uh, I'm up on a hill. So my soils are terribly wet and mushy and so on and so forth. And, um, and I've never seen it quite that bad. Uh, so to maintain that water over this last 24 years with a proactive approach means that we fix it first and the flooding that you suffered this spring, if anybody had water in their yards or basement, would have been 15 or 20 times worse had we not taken a proactive approach over the last 24 years, that's the point. And we continue to do that. We set up protocol to do that now um, so that it's regular routine. So we have several petition projects in um, Meridian Township that I think you should take a look at. Um, if you haven't been over to Tower Gardens, you should. It's absolutely gorgeous. There's over 150 rain gardens in that project. It has um, uh, been a screaming success from all points of view. There are two drains over there. One costs two million to build and the other one costs uh, seven point something to build. And it's the largest constructed rain garden complex in the country that we know of. And uh, it's here in Meridian Township and it's been a very good success. It's cut the peak flow rate to the Looking Glass River down by 94%. And when the water goes in, we used to have probably about 60 to 70% of all those houses in that neighborhood had basement water problems and their sumps ran 24 hours a day at times. And hardly any of the sumps run anymore. The water is captured, it's stored, and it's dissipated through the drain system and, and it goes through all these rain gardens and it evaporates through the plants. And very little of it winds up going to the Looking Glass River. So that's been a great success and it's absolutely gorgeous if you get a chance to drive through there. Um, another uh, drain project, project that I'd like to talk to you about, at least a part of it, is the Smith drain. And we were petitioned, we successfully uh, obtained a petition to fix the Smith drain. It was generated because the tube under Okemos Road was collapsing. It was all rusted out and falling apart. So we've, we had to rebuild it. If we rebuild it and made it larger, which we had to do to solve the flooding problems on the highway, that meant that we were gonna flood everything downstream uh, to a greater extent than it was uh, currently with the old drain uh, set up. So we readjusted some wetland complexes south of Jolly, be north of Jolly Road and um, west of Okemos Road. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of those. We did that with a goal to develop and enhance the values and functions of those wetlands. And here's a before shot and after shot. So you can see the pond on the lower picture um, used to be just a, a, some swamp uh, muck soils and so on. Well, we dug all those out and created, uh, and this is the first spring for that uh, complex. So they're all planted with wetland plants and uh, they're built specifically to enhance habitat values, but they're more importantly to the management of water, they're built so that they can handle that extra water by fixing the tube underneath Jolly Road. And we not only solved the flooding problem on the highway, um, but we also solved a lot of other uh, flooding problems and properties along uh, to the south of this location. Uh, the weir that you see right there is calibrated to allow only so much water to go out so it protects everybody downstream and so on. There is another shot of the Smith drain before and after. I think there's a remarkable difference. Don't let the green golf course looking lawn fool you. Those are really wetland grasses and and so on, they're just now starting to come up. So it's gonna be absolutely beautiful. And you have a hiking, biking path that goes through there. And uh, it's, it's, this is a nice addition, I think, to, um, to that path and the uh, people who wanna walk it. Here's another shot in one of the open ponds that we have. And you can see it's full of water right now uh, due to the heavy rain that we have. And uh, the engineer, uh, James Ensign, who has changed companies, he doesn't work for him anymore, but uh, um, he did an extraordinary job and Carla Close uh, was the deputy that I put in charge of this project and they went out of their way to make this very, very nice. So you ought to be very proud of this drain. There's another shot of two shots from different angles that show some of the ingress and egress out of the uh, ponds into the main drain flow. 
The um, Ember Oaks project uh, drain, if you recall, we had, we worked on that for about four years in co cooperation with the conservation um, land preservation uh, committee here on, in Meridian. And um, the problem with that is these are before pictures. Uh, water was coming down off of the development to the south underneath the railroad tracks and just screaming right through here, making all kinds of bad gullies, eroding soils, and so on. And when we were done with the project, um, we stabilized these banks. There was some of these cuts in the banks were big enough to drive a Volkswagen through. It was that bad. And it all happened within about five or six years after the development uh, had gone in. And so we worked with the developer to retain more water, and then we stabilized these banks and made a variety of different streams and pathways and so on, and armored them with uh, rocks and vegetation. And uh, the project has been another great success, and it, I think it offers a great opportunity for the citizens of Meridian Township to, uh, uh, to recreate and uh, go for walks and, you know, and enjoy that, uh, that hunk of wilderness right in the middle of Meridian Township. Um, the Namoka drain is another petition that we're working on and we're getting ready to start construction this summer. And this drain, uh, this is a map of the areas that flood in the Namoka drain. The Mo Monoka subdivision, right up on the upper right hand corner is Lake Lansing. And the Namoka drain was built over 100 years ago. And uh, the neighborhood that it supplies drainage to is um, some of the oldest housing that's in Meridian Township. Uh, a lot of the drains that are in the street are very small caliber um, clay pipes, but joint pipes <laughs> right in the road. So we're replacing all of those and we have to have a place to store all this water where it does no harm. So um, I'll give you some shots of um, some of the flooding that occurs. These are some of the shots of flooding that we're trying to um, avoid. And you can see how massive the flooding is. Uh, the shopping center in the lower left-hand corner of that slide is a clear indication of how much water is on Marsh Road and, and uh, the intersection of Marsh Road and Lake and uh, Hazlitt Road. And uh, when we're done, we will have reached the capacity of storage within this watershed to store and treat before we put it into the Pine Lake Outlet drain um, to the west, uh, all of this water. And it should dry up a lot of houses. Now we had to buy some property and we're gonna create some ponds and holding places for it. Um, and we're in the process of negotiating for the last piece of property that we need. And when that's done, we put our final plans together, we go to bid and we should be in construction mode this summer. Okay? Uh, this is a shot of the watershed or of the uh, of the uh, drainage district that we're working on, okay? And then I'd like to talk about the Red Cedar River itself. Um, I just received a grant from DNR for $427,000 and some change to uh, rebuild the parts of the river from uh, Kalamazoo Street to Harrison Street, right on the edge of East Lansing and Lansing. and. Um, that project is the first of many kinds of projects that we're gonna to try to uh, uh, conduct along the whole stretch of the Red Cedar River. Part of our effort to create fish habitat and to make the stream more natural, um, which I think uh, we're gonna talk about the 100 year storm events and what impact they have on the hydrograph of a river uh, in, in a minute. But the real problem is, is that over the last hundred years, we've developed the land in such a way that we didn't account for all the runoff, and the runoff just literally blew the river out. If you go on to MSU's campus on Farm Lane, you can cross that bridge. It's quite a big bridge. There's no way that you can jump from one side to the other. But in 1900, that was a narrow place. If you got a running head start, you could almost make it across the river with a jump, and it was that skinny. The Red Cedar River, has been blown out, literally blown out. The banks have been blown away and the hydrograph for that river is huge. Um, when it rains, it peaks six, seven feet in depth a lot of times, and then it goes back down to a very low depth, to inches. The trick is to keep the water, uh, uh, the flow of water off the land, 
monitored in such a way where it hits pre, I call it pre-Columbus rates of flow. Um, not pre-development rates of flow, but pre-Columbus. And I know we'll never get there, but it's nice to think that we could possibly get there. So I call it the pre-Columbus rates of flow. So that's our real target when we try to rebuild these drains, is to hold the water back and not let it go to the river. Even though there are pre-developed rates of flow, there are more gallons that come off the land simply because um, it might be moving at the same rate that it, was, the, the, that it was moving to the river, but there's millions of gallons more than what went to the river before because there was nothing in between to absorb the water or to uh, trans-evaporate it into the, in, you know, into the space, into the air, or absorb it further into the ground. We've destroyed most of the wetlands by draining them, and we have to replace that something uh, that can mimic that kind of activity. So I'm a wetland lover, and uh, we use techniques that are uh, labeled low impact design. They're rain gardens, bioswales, constructed wetlands, and a whole variety of other techniques in our toolbox that we use. So when we rebuild these drains, the 236 drains that I'm in charge of going into the Red Cedar River, eventually, probably not in my tenor, but uh, the person who takes over after me will you know, keep challenges, uh, will keep those challenges in front of him, him or her, and uh, strive to bring those rates of flow back down to the pre-Columbus rates of flow. And when we do that, the river then will, can stabilize itself. And that's the time when we want to go in and rebuild the banks and put some, uh, some depth uh, to the river and get the slope of the river and the slope of the flow back to where it should be. And then we can really call it a nice fishery. And uh, um, Ingham County has a uh, trail millage that they're working on. And um, part of that trail millage is going to be spent on uh, a blue trail. And they want Red Cedar and Sycamore Creek to be part of that effort. And uh, so to, we can make them pa uh, you know, canoe friendly and, uh, and um, kayak fr uh, friendly, then we can put more people and recreate and touch it more and you know, be comfortable um, uh, interacting with the river in a more positive way. These dams that are in blockages in the river that you see in front of you here on that screen, that log is six foot in diameter. We think that it fell into the river someplace around 1910, 1909, the nearest we can figure. And it's been there ever since. And we yanked that out of the river just east of um, Hagedorn Road um, near Indian Hill subdivision. And the water actually went down two feet I could watch it go down. It was really kind of strange to watch that water just slowly go down. I stood there and watched it for about two hours, and it went down 2.8 feet when I pulled that log out of there. We pulled out the size of that log, about seven piles of debris behind it. Uh, shopping carts and picnic tables and all that crap. We pulled it all out from behind there and disposed of it properly. Um, we have to date, I think it's seven dams that we've taken out and uh, along the Red Cedar and one in uh, Sycamore Creek. And we're going to be taking out, I'm thinking around 10 more, um, hopefully some this summer and then some the next summer. And if we can eliminate that, those blockages and put some flow patterns back into the river that are more in keeping with what it used to be, uh, you're going to have a wonderful resource coming through your your community. And all of that effort is being done through the use of the drain code. So all of these uh, blockages back water up and they uh, impact the efficiency of the drain that's actually draining your subdivisions and so on and your shopping malls. And uh, the drain code allows me to go into the river and take those blockages away. So we're systematically going through the system and we'll probably take about, I'm thinking in the next four years we'll probably hit maybe 25 or 30 of them and it'll change the course of that river substantially when we do that. Then we just have to work out a plan to maintain it with volunteers and so on, and uh, the Paddle Club of Lansing is one group, and uh, Mid-Michigan Environmental Action Council is another that they like to have volunteers go out, and we can take care of some of those smaller jams. These large ones like this tree here, though, you need some heavy equipment. You don't want to be near it when we're yanking on it. That log, I have to tell you, was water-soaked. I don't know what it weighed. But it almost dumped over an extra large excavator with a large reach on it. And that excavator almost went in the river. 
we could hardly pull that thing out. But when it came out, it, you could hear the sucking sound in the muck below. <laughs> it was a strange event. But it was kind of cool, though. Um, so you'll see changes in the river. Um, a lot more fish populations will come. We're going to build fish habitats and so on using a variety of different grant mechanisms in, uh, over the next few years. So all in all, I have to say that the water system uh, in Meridian Township, because of our proactive maintenance policy and the rebuilding of the drains that have been really badly maintained over the last hundred years, um, and the way that we've been doing it with low impact design has not only saved money, they're cheaper to build that way. Um, they do take a little bit of maintenance, um, but you, it's hard to spend on maintenance the same amount of money you saved by building it with low impact design. And I'd just like to press this point home before I answer any questions. Um, just take the toll gate drain in Lansing, Lansing Township. To fix that drain properly would have cost, the way that they typically do engineering projects on stormwater infrastructure, would have been somewhere between 23 and $28 million. I built the toll gate drain and rebuilt the Grossback Golf Course for $6.2 million. And we saved $18 million. If you take that, and we, it only costs us around 30000 a year to maintain that system, we can maintain the system for like 550 years and not spend what we saved. I mean, that's really the way you want to look at proper ecosystem and infrastructure management, is from the long-term gain that you get from, from maintaining it properly. And you have to spend maintenance money. Um, the maintenance money that we spend is, uh, is all done in a proactive approach. So we try to fix it when it costs a nickel instead of it costing, you know, 10 nickels. And uh, we find great success in doing that. And we have a system now where we're inspecting all of our drains once every three years. And um, I think we're doing a good job. I'm really proud of my staff for stepping up to the uh, plate and meeting all the challenges that I've thrown at them. Um, <coughs> I would like to say, too, that we're getting ready to start on the Montgomery drain. That's the Frandor one. I think that's going to impact Michigan Avenue and Grand River. Um, it's going to be a destination place. There's about a, somewhere around a half a billion dollars worth of uh, commercial development going in, and the drain bill will be somewhere around $30 million. But we're going to have, just from Grand River down to Michigan Avenue, there are going to be over 23 waterfalls coming through the system. We're daylighting a lot of the pipes that are under the ground and we're making streams and creeks that are going to run 24 hours a day, all year round, evaporating the water, cleaning the water. We have a bunch of different techniques that we're using for, um, uh, for uh, pollution um, abatement and extraction. And that watershed, just to put it in comparison to some watersheds you may have here, the Montgomery Drain watershed is a little less than a square mile. It's um, somewhere around two-thirds of a square mile. And it's 80% impervious, meaning parking lots, roofs, sidewalks, and roads. And we've been studying it now for about, all the discharges have been monitored now for about three years. And I can tell you with this, with, uh, from my chemists are telling me this, um, these numbers, that there's between 50,000 and 75,000 pounds of pollutants that enter the Red Cedar River from that one watershed alone. And there are 236 of those along the Red Cedar River this one being the worst, but the rest all have problems associated with it too. So we have to not only go after controlling volume of water, but we have to control what comes into it in the form of pollution and how we're gonna discharge it back into the ecosystem so that we can uh, enjoy it. And it, will, it just improves our quality of life in so many ways. So I guess with that, I will answer questions. I know that uh, one of our commissioners uh, lives almost on top of <clears throat> one of the drains that you're uh, you were talking about, the uh, Ember Oaks, um, and uh, is uh, one of the people who recreates along that that new trail. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a very nice addition. I have experiences on both sides of the timeline, previous to the project. And it was definitely a mess, and you really changed it up. I see people down there all the time having fun. And That's wonderful. Uh, you know, I just rebuilt the Bancroft Park in Lansing, and hardly anybody ever went there. And every time I go out there now, there's like 15 people walking the path. People have wheelchairs and baby strollers and bicycles. Or it's just fun. And I think that if we do that, 
these water, the water that we have used to be called waste. We'd drain the swamp, you know, and we'd call it wastewater, and we didn't care whether it was polluted or not. That's one of our greatest resources, only second to the people that we have living here. And if we can manage that water resource properly, it's going to increase everybody's quality of life, just like the young gentleman said. Any other questions? Questions down at this end? Well, you know, we've been hearing from different speakers about uh, the impact of climate change in a township like ours is more severe uh, rain events, basically, and more likely flooding. I'm wondering, does uh, are you going to be are you going to be have to change the way you do business, or how does that impact what you do on a, a yearly basis, or over the next ten years, or whatever? Sure. We used to run numbers using a place marker called a 100-year recurrent, or a 1% recurrent storm, which is a 100-year storm. Does it mean that it happens every 100 years? It only means that it has 1% chance of happening in any given storm event. Um, the, storm, the storms used to be, years ago, more than likely the storm was uh, wide, it was big, it, was, uh, it rained equally everywhere, the clouds covered a lot of space and so on. Right now, they're all microbursts, and you can get five inches of rain in a very small area. And that's a lot of water to handle. And sometimes it comes down in two or three hours. In the last four or five years, we've experienced four inches and up to five inches of rain in small, uh, maybe quarter of a mile areas. And what that, that's, that overwhelms the infrastructure that we have in the ground today. So taking into consideration, several desires that we have. One is to reduce the peak runoff going to the rivers and reduce flooding along the rivers, but also um, get rid of the water uh, that we've created when we change the use of that land. Anytime we modify the land use, we have increased the flow going to the river. So we want to build our infrastructure in a way that holds that water back without flooding anybody and can handle those large storm events or downpours. And, and if you don't believe climate is changing, it is changing. You can trust me, I'm telling you, it's changing. I have to chase this water downhill you know, every day. Every time it rains, I'm out there chasing it. And it's different than it was. It's not the same. And so when we rebuild drains with petitions or we build new drains, we're requiring our standards are, going to, are changing slightly. And then they're going to change big time here. And, and probably in the next year, you're going to see our standards change altogether. We would like to hold back more of that water than what we've been holding back. One, the, the existing standards don't allow enough flow to leave in those microbursts. So you wind up with isolated flooding for at least eight to 10 hours in any given subdivision, and it doesn't get away fast enough. And so we can do two things. We can enlarge the pipes and put it all in the river faster, which hurts our, our desire to make the flow consistent with the pre-developed or pre-developed uh, conditions. Or we can rebuild the drains differently to hold water in different ways. In Delhi Township, I just finished a project uh, called the Green Four Consolidated Drain Drainage District. And we used um, constructed ditches on a non-curbed road. And I'm telling you, they work so well. They were incredible. They go six feet deep with engineered soils, perforated pipe surrounded by gravel, wrapped in a cloth. And we have a, uh, we worked with uh, Professor Crum at MSU's uh, um, um, grass, he turf talked grass. about turf grass stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, we got a, a fall fescue in there that is absolutely phenomenal. Looks like a lawn, but it's not the typical lawn grass. And the roots are longer. They go down eight, nine, ten feet. Keep the keep it permeated in a way that is that the ditch can handle not only large microbursts, but it's stored within that six-foot cavity, in between the space between the rocks that we got down in there and the pipes and whatever. So um, when we redesign the way that we think about moving water off the surface of the earth, what we move it into is big deal, and. That can change the way the water affects the river and affects localized flooding. So if we can put it someplace where it fell, allow it to manipulate with the soil and the plants, and allow it to leave slower, 
we will have accomplished all of our wish list stuff. And uh, we're, we're moving to standards now that do just that. Uh, so we have to respond to this change in climate. Um, and the drain code is a beautiful tool that allows us to uh, construct and maintain these drains in that fashion. So uh, to answer your question, yes, we are responding to the change in the weather. Yes, the weather is changing. And we're reaching into our toolbox now with new and innovative ways to do things. My office alone has invented, I don't know, we're written up in so many white papers and whatever, I don't know. We can't even keep track of all the stuff that we're doing. The engineering companies that we're hiring are just, they, they're hungry and they want to think outside the box and really come up with new stuff. We can no longer lean on the old book of engine, the black book of engineering anymore because it doesn't fit today's standards. So we have to think differently. We have to think outside the box and think systemically. We can't just build infrastructure to handle you can't just build a road to move cars. The road has to become part of your community, has to accommodate biking and uh, automobile traffic and so on. Stormwater is the same way. We want to accommodate ecosystem development and improve the quality of life for neighborhoods and keep basements dry. The Green Four is a perfect example of that. And so is the Tower Garden one here, and so is the Toll Gate. All the big projects that I've done accomplish those goals. And on the we haven't done the, the runoff numbers yet on the green four, but I'm almost positive it's going to be somewhere in the 90% reduction of peak runoff, even in heavy storm, storm events. And the people there just absolutely love it. And I, there's another factor that you might want to consider too. If you go into Meridian Town, or um, into Tower Gardens here in Meridian Township, for example, we did a, stu we did a, a short study on the roads cracking up. The pipes that we put next to the road perforated with rain gardens. The typical road when you lay it and you have curb and gutter, within the first year, it goes through one winter, it usually has hairline cracks. Usually the year after that, you start to develop larger cracks in pots, small potholes, with the third year producing potholes. We still haven't found that many hairline cracks. It's been eight years. Mm. So the life cycle cost of operating your roads using low impact design is a cost savings not only just for the drain, but it's a cost savings for all the other infra infrastructure related to it. Um, we got to get away from this concept of you know, curb and gutter is okay in some places, but not every place. And we need to eliminate those obstacles to uh, proper stormwater management and then still make it livable and attractive and comfortable for people to live there. So that's our goal. And uh, we're doing a, I think we're doing a, my staff is doing an outstanding job. And um, they think I'm a little bit crazy because they come <laughs> up with all these weird ideas, but whatever, you know. But they work. And, um, you know, I speak, a lot, I give lectures all over the place. And uh, I just spoke at Olivet College. And they just kept me there for like three hours and asked questions and whatever. And oh, I think we'll, that try the, to, we'll try to beat that record tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm almost done. I just want to say that it's no, a no, you're not. To, you're just getting started. I just love this. I, uh, I know there's a lot more <laughs> questions up here. <clears throat> I just take this opportunity to teach because it's that's if, if we don't know, if you personally don't know or care, I mean, people are worried about paying their light bills and their mortgage payments and going to work on time, getting the kids to school and whatever. They don't think about infrastructure, but I think we have to start teaching people how to think about it in a, in a maybe even a casual way hmm. uh, would be better than no way at all. So this is very important stuff, and it defines the quality of life that we are. And I'd just like one, one more statement to that effect. My minor in college is cultural anthropology. And if you look at cultures and how they form and die off and go away, there are four things that you have to have to have a city or a township like this. You've got to have a place to flush your toilet, a place to put the storm water, a consistent source of clean drinking water with no lead in it, hopefully. and um, a transportation system. You take one of those things away, you can't have a village. Hmm. It's just that simple. So those four infrastructures, except for transportation, all the rest are underground. And we're starting to bring our stormwater pipes up, opening them up and making little creeks running down the street and putting it right in people's face so they can think of it a little bit differently. And that really is the key to get people to think about those things they can't see. Out of, my, out, out of sight, out of mind is not a solution to these major problems we face with infrastructure across this country. So we have to start thinking differently and start producing better results with new innovative engineering that costs less money and improve our quality of life 
and protect the public for health, safety, and welfare. Wow. Commissioner Kubasso, I saw you reaching for the microphone there. No? no? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. No. no. Okay. Could you repeat that question for the uh, He wants to know if I'm going to take out the dam at MSU right near the administration building, I think, right? Yeah, that's not coming out, not that I know of. If that comes out, it's going to be between the DEQ and uh, um, MSU. I've had some conversation with some of them, yes. And uh, some of the path that that is going to take is uh, Sorry, is going to be a Sorry, one more time. One. Could you just repeat that for the okay. tape? Thanks. He wants to know Thanks. if uh, there's, a, there's an effort to extend the river trail in Meridian Township. And mm -hmm. the question is whether or not I've had conversations with some of the people Thanks. involved. And yes, I have. Um, I'm not that detailed on it uh, for this conversation, but I can tell you that uh, any extension of those trails is a good thing. And uh, we'll do whatever we can to accommodate a successful um, extension of those trails. And we still have to take care of the, of the river, too, you know. It's not just the paper cups and the debris that wind up in there that people see. It's the chemistry that you can't see that's in those rivers that need to be addressed. And that we do by managing the land, not the river. It's easy to clean up if you don't put it in. <laughs> I got a couple more questions back here. Yes. Yes. You mentioned the drain code. Is that county or state? That's a state. She asked if I uh, could explain the drain code a little bit. The drain code is a state law, and it's unique to Michigan. And it has an elected official in each county that is in charge of the stormwater infrastructure. And almost in every county, the elected drain commissioner, or whoever who or she is, also plays a role of the county uh, public works director. And we're also uh, man state man by law, we're state mandatory members of the Parks Board. So the Drain Commissioner serves those three laws. But we're also on the emergency response, uh, first responder teams for things like uh, tanker truck spills and all of that. Um, flooding incidences, we, my staff works 24 hours a day sometime nonstop when we have a lot of rain. Um, and uh, there's about 28 different state laws that, um, that my office has to deal with and the drain commissioner has to do, is obligated by law to do. I have to sign every plat, every new development has to come across my desk. So we're gonna be imposing these new standards on all of this new development whenever it happens. The economy's gonna come back and people are gonna wanna build stuff. They'll knock down old stuff and build new stuff and we have to retrofit all that new stuff, the new building and commercial development with the proper infrastructure so that we can reach our goals and objectives for a better clean water world. Does that help? Yeah, so if you were to change the drain code in any way to improve it, what would you do? I like the drain code the way it is. Um, it has a lot of court cases that have, it's been tested. So it gives us an opportunity to say that, uh, you know, the thing that people don't like about Everybody wants me to fix their problems, but nobody wants to pay for it. It all comes down to money. And the drain code forces people to pay their share by benefit derived. Um, counties, uh, township and municipalities have to pay for public, have to pay a share for public health, safety and welfare. And they don't like paying that. It comes out of their general fund. It, but it's one of the most important things that they can invest their money in because it is the foundation of a good society to have good running infrastructure. And um, while they may not think of it that way, they should. And uh, someday, maybe everybody will be on board and understand transportation, sewage, drinking water, and, and uh, storm water, because those are the foundations of every community. And if we don't pay attention to them, and if you just slide by and let people put in stuff that doesn't work or substandard, uh, you know, roads and infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure, drinking water. Look what happened to Flint with lead in their pipes, you know? They tried to save 80 bucks a week by not treating that water with a prohibitor for lead. 80 bucks a week, I mean, come on. And that, that was, came out of the governor's uh, uh, guy that he put in charge, executor or whatever Emergency he put in charge. Emergency manager. And uh, I met with the mayor of Flint and some city council people several times now. and. Um, 
I'm working with the county drain commissioner up there. We're collaborating on some ideas and uh, so on and so forth. The point is, is that we can't just say it's too expensive. We can't afford it. You can't not afford it in the end. Now, we don't want to just spend money to spend money. We want to make sure that everything we built works and it's worth the dime that you're putting into it. But I can tell you for a fact that low impact design is cheaper than conventional engineering and it works better. It moves more water, slower, keeps the peak flows rates down, prevents flooding, and cleans the water at the same time. I mean, what's not to like about it? You know, it's like a good homemade pie, a cold <laughs> glass of milk. I mean, what's not to like, you know? I saw another hand in the back there. Yes. <clears throat> Uh -huh. And I've even heard in this township that sometimes those lines were laid very close to each other. Yes. And there's been shifts of earth. Mm -hmm. Some of the sanitary goes into your stuff, and that, I know that okay. makes you unhappy. So, <coughs> is it the community's responsibility for the sanitary s systems, and you're only responsible for the stormwater system? <coughs> well, um, all communities have different sanitary treatment systems. Some of them have treatment plants, others use lagoon systems and so on. And they're all approved by the DEQ. And the infrastructure that you're talking about that conflict with each other were put in the ground 50 years ago. And who knows who laid pipes back then. You know, we just, we, when we run across those conflicts, the utility conflicts, we solve them. We try to solve them with the, with the, uh, you know, the other utility. We've had gas lines drilled right through concrete storm pipes, and they put a 10-inch force main right through a 25-inch pipe. We had to call consumers, and they had to dig it up. You know, they got these guys out there with the drills, and they don't see where the thing's going. They go right through our pipe. They got those drill heads that go right through concrete, and uh, they've had about six or seven of those in the last eight years, gone wow. right through our pipes. So. Um, we have standards for that. The gas lines are under pressure, so they can be bent and they can be deeper and shallower and whatever, and avoid our pipes. So we force all of those utilities, cable, other utilities that, have, that are under pressure, like drinking water, they can go deeper, and they have to be five feet below the bottom of our drain. That's our standard. Now, sometimes they can't reach five feet, maybe it's four feet, but our standard is five. So we find those conflicts all over the place. And when we find them, we solve them. <coughs> yes? About five years ago, there was an article about your operation in the Lancer State Journal. And one of the major points was that you're having a hard time from like the pipeline companies to repair their facilities or even to tell you where they are. Is that yeah. True? Yes. Um, there are several pipeline companies that come through here. And it's a very good question because. It's an infrastructure that we all, we all drive cars, come on. And we fill it up with gas and we need the gas. If you was to take the amount of gas that comes through those gasoline and petroleum products that come through those uh, pipes and put them in tanker trucks, from New York to Seattle, there would be three abreast touching each other. That's how many trucks we could put on the highway if we didn't put it in a pipe. So the pipe is a necessary evil, I guess you call it. Um, because you can take that, those trucks off the road, that's good, okay, and they spill. The problem is, is that the oil companies are regulated by the federal government. But when they come into Michigan, we have drain easements. And the, the rule of thumb for easements is first, first in time is first in right. So they have to now obey, every time they cross about 89 of my drains or something like that, there, there maybe it's 189, I can't remember the number, but it's a lot. So all these crossings that they're putting all these new pipes in, we're forcing them to go five feet below. And I wanna tell you, they don't like me. They just <laughs> don't like me. And the problem with all the leaks that they've had that I've looked at, with very few exceptions, we're at the junctions of where they have shutoff valves and stuff. It's those things that leak. Uh, the Kalamazoo leak, I think, was at one of those junctions. It's not the pipe itself that leaks. But if they didn't put them deep enough, my people, when they maintain the drain with the big hydro hole, would hit them. I've got two or three of them that run right into my drain, and they're like a dam. So we're forcing them to move those over time. 
Uh, it's impossible for them to just click their fingers and make them go away. So uh, we're working with them as best we can, and we've become first name basis with almost all of the pipe company uh, foremen or whatever they call them, the planners or for the pipelines or whatever. And we stick to it, and we make them pay for an inspector that's out there all the time that they're laying pipe. They have one of my inspectors out there, and they pay for it. And they pay for a permit, and we have everything surveyed by a surveyor. So we know exactly the depth of that pipe now. Then I talked to the guy at uh, Enbridge Pipe Company, and uh, he was out of Canada. And um, I talked to somebody there, it was one of the higher ups and whatever, he said, he, I said, well, why don't you just show us where all your pipes are? We can investigate and we can figure it all out. He says, well, I can't tell you. And I said, what do you mean you can't tell me? He says, Homeland Security, it prohibits me from telling you. Ah. Now who in their right mind is gonna go out in the cornfield and blow up a cornfield? I mean, if they want to blow up a pipeline. That really is a ridiculous statement. First of all, if they tell us where it is, why would I tell anybody? I mean, you know, if it's underground and it's safe, it doesn't matter. So um, it's just a ridiculous attitude. So we went through, I had, a, I don't know how many thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars I've got tied up in attorneys negotiating with their attorneys just to get the information we need. Now that we won that battle, we're in the negotiating process to start lowering these pipes and put them in the proper place. We're starting with the new ones that they're putting in and we're moving through all the other ones that are in uh, bad shape and are uh, not located properly or not deep enough. So some of them are like six inches below the bottom depth of the drain. And you know, nobody watched them going in in the 1950s, nobody cared, yeah. they just put them there. So, but we care today, and we, we inspect it. And they don't like me inspecting it, but I do it. Well, yes. Go ahead. So the principle earlier about benefit derived uh -huh. makes sense for storm drains or improving for and or with that. Mm -hmm. But for something like Enbridge screwing up or Tager going over. Mm -hmm. They have to pay all our costs. They pay, they get the cost. they pay all, no. Nope. If there's a spill and my crew has to respond along with the state police and any fire department that has to go out there and so on and our crew has to then make sure that it doesn't get into our drains and so on so we block them and whatever. There's a company that comes out and works with us to suck it up into a confined truck or whatever. And uh, so we handle that material. They have to pay 100% of that. Um, that just yep. But the benefit is surely to <coughs> Well, you're their customer. You fill your car up with their product. Okay, and there's another thing about that. Um, you know, there's a big battle with ice, ice, uh, ice mountain drinking water. Do you have ice mountain over there in the table? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nestle company, you know, is going into the Supreme Court uh, eventually with this issue about withdrawing water, putting it in a bottle, and making it um, into a saleable product. And this is my spin on that. This is a thing that I think you ought to keep your eye on and perhaps get involved in. Um, the Great Lakes has 20% of the available fresh water in the world. Because we have so much water, even when it rains, we, we think we got so much that we don't have to worry about it. Well, here's where we draw a line in the sand, and this is where we should start taking care of this water. We should have policies and directives that maintain this water in a health and safe fashion, right? Now, that oil company that pumping gallons, millions of gallons of gasoline and petroleum products through that pipe, they told me they're making somewhere around a nickel a gallon. If, if Nestle is right and they win their suit, it's gonna, what water withdrawal is gonna be called a commodity. And under the commerce laws, including NAFTA, they can't stop them from selling it outside the Great Lakes Basin. If they turn, take the oil out of those pipes and put Great Lakes water into them and run them to Texaco and, or Texas and uh, Arizona and Mexico City, they'll get about $11.80 a gallon profit instead of a nickel. Now you don't think there's some incentive in there for them to negotiate this issue? And they're gonna spend millions of dollars to defend their right to take that water out and they're gonna argue, in the end, they're gonna argue it's a commodity and they can't stop it from leaving here. And there's uh, several lawsuits going on right now. Um, they just wanted, they just submitted a request to improve their, to uh, in, up near Hershey, Michigan, to um, get three times more water extraction out of the ground is what they have now. And I just, you know, I don't buy Nestle products. That's just my own personal 
choice, but I fight back with my dollar that way. I won't even buy Nestle chocolate chips. So, you know? so to continue on that question, do you have any thoughts on the fact that the withdrawal permit for the um, Karagandi uh, pipeline is actually 85 MGD? They don't need 85 MGD for Genesee County or Flint. Well, anything close on, that. That's correct, and that's that's a gray issue in terms of supplying fresh water to citizens through a municipally owned utility. It's different than a company coming in here and taking now, the water. No, I'm and talking about what. Why did they get 85 MGD? No, I can't answer that question. I don't know. Because um, they don't need 85 MGD, but that's what the permit's for. Well, they have commitments from townships outside of Genesee County. They still don't need anything close to 85. Yeah. I can guarantee you that. Well, you and you and Jeff Wright, the drain commissioner from Genesee County, should have a conversation. <laughs> it would be interesting. Yeah, I'll try to set up a lunch for the three of us. Um, if I could bring you back to um, some township issues. Um, we were talking about uh, constructed wetlands and other measures that we can take to uh, mitigate these uh, 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 flash floods, the, the peak storm events. Um, <clears throat> so the Meridian Township has a, a development policy of uh, no net loss of wetland, and this commission gets involved in reviewing development projects that have some wetland impact to make sure that at least any, any wetland that's impacted uh, is compensated mm -hmm. with some mitigation measures. Um, so I guess a couple of questions. Uh, the consultants that the township uses um, uh, assess the, the success of those mitigations quite high. As far as they're concerned, most of the mitigation, wetland mitigation that's been done in Meridian Township is, is working. Mm -hmm. It's doing what it was, what it was meant to do. Um, so the first question is, is, is that your impression? And the second is, um, going forward, is no net loss uh, a sufficient policy for uh, a township like Meridian? No net loss. My personal preference is one and a half to two times the volume. So if they destroy an acre of wetland, they should put in two. That's my opinion. Uh, the compacted soils in a wetland um, once you start making a, a wetland out of an open field and you create a new one, it's a, it would be comparing a, a Monet to a Velvet Elvis. I mean, there's just no comparison to a naturally developed wetland. You had some good looking Velvet Elvises there. Yes, I know. <laughs> and I'm not arguing that you can't build one. Uh -huh. I'm only arguing that to preserve them would be better. That's the first thing that should happen is to try to preserve the existing wetlands. Right. Even the tenth of an acre ones, the fernal wetlands that uh, provide habitat for tree frogs and salamander eggs and so on and so forth. All of those are so important to our ecosystem. So if there's a way to build around it or to reconfigure the subdivision in a way or the shopping center to accommodate it, then you should save them. If there isn't, okay, fine. Then you should go to great lengths to make sure that you're putting in something that's not a velvet Elvis. <laughs> Any other questions from other commissioners? Please. Um, I had a question about who is developing the new standards? My office. Okay. And I had a question slash suggestion. I have to sign them and approve them. Oh, very good. Have you considered going into the local schools, whether high schools or middle schools, to talk to kids about this? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, career options right there. Sure. Engineering, um, I mean, I've met one, with the uh, Oklahoma's Environmental Club uh, from Oklahoma's High School, and they want to build some rain gardens on Oklahoma's High School's campus, so we're going to help them. i got two engineers uh, from two different companies that's going to donate their time and energy to build and design and draw the plans for two okay rain gardens along the side of the south side of Okemos, and they have to go through the school board permission and all those things that they have to go through that. And I don't know where that is right now. I was going to try to call, I thought maybe it might come up, but uh, um, uh, I was going to try to call my engineers to see how far along they are on the plans. But they're, they're going to develop plans and then these kids are going to try to raise money and build them and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I talk to schools all the time. Okay. I lecture at least three or four places a month, and um, my lectures range everything from high school classes to uh, engineering classes to fishery and wildlife. I just spent 
three hours of lectures um, at Ovid uh, College, okay. or Olivet College, I mean. And a uh, very nice campus, by the way. You know, the town of Olivet has like 300 people in it, and there's 1,000 students. <laughs> <They're>, like, <laughs> overwhelmed. Yeah, East Lansing, there's nothing to compare to the, the population difference in East Lansing. There's less students, or there's, there's a lot of students. I have 50,000 students out there, but it's not like Ovid, or um, Olivet, I mean. It's interesting. Some very dedicated teachers there. It's a great college. I was uh, I was uh, absolutely impressed. But I, I lecture all the time to answer your question. Thank you. All over the place Thank to anybody that I'll preach clean water to anybody, any place. Okay. I'm just curious if you're familiar with a company uh, by the name of Arjana, and if so, if you have any thoughts on their product. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about them? Yeah, they, they apparently have a system where they claim to be able to. Uh, Fairly inexpensively direct surface water into through the, the ground. ground. Yeah, it's a plastic tube, mm -hmm. and they drill it through the ground. I'm <laughs> I'm very familiar with it. They asked me to endorse their product, and I wouldn't. Um, they wanted to their pitch when they talked to me. I met with them. And they they wanted me to endorse their product for draining wetlands, basically, and um, I refused to do that. So they don't have my endorsement for that. But if somebody's got a, a backyard that's wet, the way it works is the water pressure itself forms a pump in this soft plastic, and it pumps itself down into the ground, uh, usually eight, nine, ten feet, something like that. Um, I suppose that's okay for some golf course to get rid of uh, some of the water on some of the fairways and that kind of thing, or maybe some backyards can do it. The thing actually works. Um, but I'm afraid that if you give a tool like that to a bunch of developers and turn them loose on land that they want to build more houses on, um, I think it might be a recipe for disaster. I would rather build around the wetlands. Anytime you want to, you know, if you wage war with water, water always wins. So to get a land use development policy through any municipality that protects all of those minor wet spots and so on, you can build around them and enhance them even, is better. But I understand that the roads have to go a certain way and there's certain safety factors with the width of road for fire trucks and ambulances and traffic and so on and so forth. And you have to destroy a wetland sometimes. But when you do that, you should make sure that when you build it, you build it right and you take great care to make sure that the constructed wetlands are actually function as a decent ecosystem. Um, recharging water into the ground, ground in general is uh, away from its natural recharge areas. There's about 15 recharges areas in Ingham County that are uh, mapped out, and we know where they are, and they usually take water pretty deep. But forcing water into the ground through a pump system of any kind and having that water go deep, all you're doing is taking the pollution from that water on the surface and putting it down into our aquifers. That's not right either. Keep it on the surface if you can. I mean, we've covered up most of our recharge areas around here with parking lots. Um, <laughs> And I can show you all those. I got a map of all those. And uh, uh, the idea is that when we build the parking lots next time, the ne new parking lot should be aware of that. And we should arrange some way to continue that natural area recharge. But forced recharge into deep ground wells, or they're called recharge wells, um, isn't a good idea. I did a very long study on those back in 76, 77, 78. And I was thinking of using them on the toll gate drain, but I found out the bacteria that you can spread and the pollution you can put into our drinking water is just horrendous. And you can't retrieve it, you can't fix it. Once it's down there, it's very expensive to get rid of and you can't correct it. So these shallow pumps, fine. I mean, they're good for certain things. I'm, I'm afraid that they're gonna go it out of hand and people will buy them at Lowe's and start draining everything that they don't want wet. And before you know it, the ecosystem's changed again. <laughs> so. You know, I just think they should be licensed and they should have a, a, a certified uh, in, a civil engineer look at it and make sure that he's not destroying something in the process of trying to drain something. That's my opinion about him. So. We've got one last question over here. Yes. We have, um, these are underground plumes, right? Okay, we, we get our drinking water primarily from uh, Saginaw Formation, and um, 
The water that comes out of the sacket is a very large sheet of concaved uh, sandstone. It actually pops up in in uh, in um, huts or uh, the bay up near Saginaw, Saginaw Bay, and it also goes up into Lake Michigan. It sticks out when you go down into Lake Michigan. You can see it on a geological map. It's a very fascinating uh, um, sandstone. We get our water, a lot of the water from that. Um, there are several industrial areas in Ingham County that have contributed pollution um, to that aquifer. Uh, one of them is a Goodyear site on Lake Lansing Road near the Grosbeck Park drain. And Goodyear uh, Tire Company, which owned Motor Wheel, um, is managing that landfill right now. And they are sucking the water out. That plume is about two and a half miles long. It goes from the cor somewhere near the corner of Wood Street and Lake Lansing, and it hits the, it goes as far as uh, the intersection of Pennsylvania Avenue. And Goodyear has done a very, very good job of back flushing that out. And they have, if you go to um, Old Town and you look at the Brinky Fish Ladder, uh, come right over to the north by the uh, Clark Hill Law Offices there, you'll see a 36 inch pipe coming out of the ground. That's the uh, Grosbeck Park drain. Goodyear actually rents that drain from me to discharge the water after they clean it and they put it in the, in the Grand River. And that goes about two and a half miles of, uh, of piping that I put under there for, the, for, that, uh, uh, for that particular drain. Um, the Board of Water and Light has some plume. Um, they've handled that. They've spent uh, millions of dollars to correct that. There are a lot of other industrial sites around here that have uh, some aquifer damage uh, attributed to their sites, um, but they're all being caught and managed. So, and Goodyear, I have to give a plug for Goodyear. You know, we allowed them to do that back in the 40s, and they provided a lot of jobs. They paid a lot of property taxes, put kids, kids to school. It's part of our responsibility now not to condemn them for it because we allowed it, but we got to work with them to solve it. And they're willing to pay the bill, so fine. Let's do it and work with them, and I'm not condemning them for having it there, um, but we're changing their attitude about cleaning it up, and they've been really, really been good stewards. So the answer to the question is yes, they exist, and uh, they exist in Ann Arbor, they exist here. They exist in Grand Rapids, too. Any other questions? Well, I have about 100,000 more questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you I can talk. Thank you very much again for coming. It's been a great well, Thank you. Thank you.